Well, here's our interpretation of that old favorite, the drop leaf table. Now, this one is made from ash, I think baseball bats are made from. It's a nice hardwood and very durable. Now, if you look at it, it has some turned legs and a little device here that holds the leaves upright when it's being used. And this little drop leaf detail right here, which aligns the tops when they're up. Now, this one has been built like they've been building them for 200 years, with the possibility of one exception. This one is made from glued up stock rather than single boards. Most of the pieces that we looked at had a severe cupping problem. In other words, the boards were curled. And that's because of uneven moisture absorption. They might have had a finish on the top, but none on the bottom. And the top might have received direct sunlight, but none underneath. So one of the ways to help minimize that cupping is to do the glue up. Now when I do it, I like to pay attention to one very important thing, the growth rings. You alternate them. So this board, they're down. And this board, they're up. And that should help relieve some of those problems. Now the other thing I pay attention to is the grain pattern. I want the board to look like one single piece. So I try to match it up so that it all blends together. Now before I can glue the pieces up, I have to make sure the joint looks good. And on this one you can see there's a little bit of space right here. So I'm going to plane it down on my joiner which is just a tool with a heavy cast bed, about three feet long. And in it, there's a wheel that rotates at a relatively high speed with three cutters. Now, these cutters happen to be solid carbide. And I like those because they last a long time. Now, before I run the board through, I want to take a look at the grain. And you can see here, the grain is running down in this direction. And if I, rotation of the blade is always clockwise. If I run it through this way, it's going to chip out at these points. So I want to turn it around, making sure that the grain runs in this direction, and I'll get a perfectly smooth cut. Now I'm ready for some glue up. I just set the boards on my pipe clamps. I want to put a nice even coat of yellow glue right on the edge of the board. And this applicator does a great job at spreading it out. Now I just put enough pressure to bring the two boards together and just squeeze out a little bit of that glue. The parts of this table that seem a little formidable are these legs. I did need a lathe to do the turning, and I had to find some stock big enough to give me a two-inch finish dimension up here at the top. I've milled the square stock and cut the pieces a little bit long. I'll do the final trimming after I do the turning. And the first thing I did was remove some material off the corners, down in the area where the turning takes place. And that's going to save me a lot of time on the lathe. Now over here at the bandsaw, I've tilted the table to 45 degrees. And since I don't want to run the piece all the way through, I've put a little pencil mark back here as a guide for a stopping point. OK. Now I'll just clamp it in my bench and use a back saw to cut off the little scraps. Over here I have a lathe set up to make copies. Okay, now that I'm within about a sixteenth of an inch of my pattern, I'm going to speed up the lathe a little bit and make the final cuts. Now 
Now by increasing the speed of the lathe a little bit more and using a variety of different grits of sandpaper, I'll smooth it all out. Well, I'm not quite finished with my leg yet. I have to cut a mortise because each rail fits into that leg. And later, I'll peg it with some doll stock. But first, to make the mortise, over on the drill press, where I've set it up with a mortising attachment. And all this really is, is a, is a square chisel into which a drill bit slides through. And as you press down, a hole gets drilled first and then the bit, the chisel, squares it off. And all the excess material will come up through this slot. Now, I've also set the depth of the drill press so that I end up with about a 3 quarter inch deep mortise. So by making several plunges into the leg, I'll end up with a perfect mortise. Now the rails have tenons which fit into those mortises I've just made in the legs. And I'll make the tenons over on the table saw. And the first cut that I want to make is this shoulder cut right here. So I've set the blade to the right depth and added this block that's clamped to the fence. And the reason that's there is because whenever you use a T-square in combination with a rip fence, you tend to sometimes get some kickback from the boards. So this block gives me a gauge to align the piece with the blade, yet before I hit the blade, I end up with some clear space in here so I won't get that twisting or kickback. For the next operation, I've raised the blade, and what I want to do is make this shoulder cut right here. So without changing anything else, I'll make the first pass through and then nibble away the rest of the material. Finally, the cheek cut, which is right along this line here. Back at our prototype base for the table, the side style and this swing arm are cut out of the same piece. And they're mitered at the ends here to act as a self-stop. The first thing I want to do is drill a hole for this screw right here. Now to make this cut right along the bottom of that support piece, I got a couple tricks for you. First of all, I don't want to use my standard saw blade because it has too wide of a kirk. It's going to remove too much material. So I found a blade that's a lot thinner, and it's still carbide tip. And in fact, this blade comes out of my circular saw. Now, what I want to do is slide my piece in underneath this feather board. And what this does is it holds the piece down, and it keeps it from kicking back. And I'm going to raise the blade up slowly through the wood, and then I can push it through to my final mark. Shut the saw down, lower the blade, and take the piece out. Now I'll bring the piece over to my bench and clamp it in the vise. I'm going to make this final cut. To do that, I'm going to use a back saw. This is just the right saw for this job because it has real fine teeth and it has a nice rigid blade which allows me to make real straight cuts. Now the idea of this swing arm is that it pivots on this screw and not get hung up and I have a couple little tricks for that. The first thing is that I have to enlarge this pilot hole I drilled earlier so the screw will just sit in there freely. 
And to do that, I'm just going to use a larger bit in the drill. Okay, with that done, I'm going to turn it over and put a little countersink so that the head of the screw will be flush or slightly recessed. Now, if you set the piece in place, you notice that if it's pushed way down, it's not flush right here. It's a little bit too low. And it's hitting on the bottom, which means it'll constantly rub. And we see a lot of old tables that fail because of that. Now, I'm going to slide it up. And I found that a little thin washer and one that's just a bit thicker is just the right amount to make it flush again. So all we have to do is stand it up. Set our washers in place. Put the swing arm in there, and we'll just drive a screw through there. Before I do any assembly of the base, I want to sand all the rails with my palm sander, which has some 120 grit sandpaper in it. Now I'm just spreading a little yellow carpenter's glue evenly on that tenon with a little brush. Now I just slip it into the mortise. And I'll drive these home. Put a clamp on it. Now this joint is secured not only with glue, but with some little dowel pins. And I've marked out the location where I have to drill the holes. And I'll use a brad point bit, quarter inch brad point bit. Put some glue on the dowel and drive it into the hole. And that joint is never going to Now for the end rails, a little bit of glue and an assemble. Clamp. And dowel. OK, one more thing. I want to add these little corner blocks. Put a little glue on them first. And what they'll do is strengthen the base and give me something that I can fasten the top down. Well, let's start making our top. Now, the glue is set up and is thoroughly dried. And I can unclamp it now. Now I'm ready to do a little sanding. And the first step is to use a belt sander. And that's really just to even up any irregularities in the surface of the top. Now, I've outfitted my belt sander with a piece of 100 grit aluminum oxide paper. And you want to be a little bit careful when you do belt sanding. You don't want to let the sander sit in one place, or else it'll dig a real deep hole in there. It's not like a little pond sander. And what I like to do is just keep it moving parallel with the grain just taking off a little bit at a time. Well, with the leaves and the top all sanded, now I'm ready to rip them for width, square them up, and cut them to length. But before I do anything to the leaves, I'm going to run one edge through the joiner to make sure that it's perfectly straight and smooth. OK, now I've set my saw up to rip them, move the rip fence into the right position. And I'm going to put that edge that I just jointed against the rip fence and cut the other side. OK, 
Okay, the next thing I want to do is square up my top and cut it to length. And to do that, I use the table saw. And the first intention usually is just to grab the piece with. That doesn't work very well because the board is long and it's heavy. And it's real hard to hold it steady as you go through the saw. It tends to want to rock like this. So we put together a little tool here at the shop. It's called a panel cutter. Really, all it is is an enlarged T-square. This one is just a piece of plywood with a strip screwed on the front edge of it. And underneath is a piece of hardwood, which fits in the same groove as the T-square. So now I have something that I can hold my pieces steady on. So first, I'll just square up one edge. Okay, with the blade stopped, I can turn the board end for end, measure it for the correct length. Well, the next thing to do is to make this drop leaf detail. Now, the top over here has a convex shape to its edge, and the leaf has a concave shape. And it's nice because it not only looks decorative, but it really serves a purpose. Let me show you. As you put the leaf up, they lap over one another. So you get support along the entire length of the table, and there's no sagging here. And I made up a little demonstration to further show that. If you just took two pieces of wood and hinged them together, with just butt joints here. When the leaf was up, you could get some sagging in the middle here, and the surfaces would be uneven. Now, it looks like a difficult thing to do, but it's really not that hard. You could use a shaper, which is just a big stationary router, and you can buy male and female cutters to make the drop leaf. However, I'm going to use a router, and you can do the job just as well. I start out with a 3 8 inch round over bit, and that's to do the edge on the main top. And the matching bit for the leaf is this 3 8 inch cove bit. Now I've mounted this bit in my router, and this one happens to be a D handle router. The early routers had just two handles. This one, with its own D handle, allows you to better control, and the trigger is right within reach, so you don't have to go over and flip a switch all the time. Now, one more thing on procedure with routers. Because all routers are made with motors that turn clockwise, as you stand in front of your work, you always move left to right. That way, the cutter and the motor are working at their best efficiency. Okay, now I'll just turn it around and do the other edge. Okay, now I'm ready to start milling this concave detail in the leaves. So I've set my router up with the 3 8 inch cove bit, but because it doesn't have a pilot bearing, I've attached a fence to the router, and this sits up against my workpiece. Now, I'm going to make this cut in a couple passes because I don't want to strain the router motor, and I want to minimize any chipping that might happen. OK, now I'm going to readjust the base of my router so that I get a little more depth out of that cut. And I'm going to run it through my sample before I make any commitment to the finished leaves. I'll take my sample and bring it over to my finished top and check the fit. Now, see, it's a little bit too high right here. So I'm going to have to make a couple more adjustments to the router, try it on my sample, and then I'll do the real leaves. Well, now I'm ready to mount some hardware on my drop leaf assembly. I've taken the top and set it in the vise with the bottom side facing up. And I don't use just an ordinary butt hinge for the drop leaf. I use a hinge 
specifically manufactured for drop leaf tables. This is an inch and a quarter hinge. It's just ordinary steel. But note that one leaf is a little bit longer than the other. We're not going to see it because it's on the bottom side of the table, but it needs to be mounted about a quarter of an inch from the edge of the table will be our center pin. The short leg of the hinge sits on the main top, the long edge on the leaf. Now to make it sit flush, I'm going to have to cut a little recess to set that pin in. And to do that, I'm going to use my router and I've installed a quarter inch round nose bit. And I've made a sample pass in a scrap of wood here. Test to see if it fits okay. And that's good. So now I'm ready to plow out all those recesses. The manufacturer has given us another clue as to which way these hinges should go. The side that faces up has a little countersink so the screw head will sit flush. Now I'm ready to attach the leaves. But I want to give myself a little space in here. So I'm just going to take some old pieces of sandpaper and that'll prevent any rubbing along that drop leaf detail. Now the hinges can be swung down and I'll drill some pilot holes to fasten the leaves to the top. Okay, now I'm going to ease these sharp corners with my belt sander. Okay, the last milling operation is to round over these edges on all four sides. And to do that, I'm going to use my quarter inch rounding over bit. Now remember, left to right. So this ash takes stain beautifully. And I apply it with a brush first, and after it sets for a couple minutes, you just take a rag and sort of even up the color. And after the stain dries, I'll put two coats of a hard urethane finish on it, and then it'll be good for many years. The only difficulty in getting a good finish with polyurethane is keeping the dust off of it until it dries. And there it is, a reproduction of the classic drop leaf table. <laughs>